Happy International Youth Day. <laughs> welcome, welcome. I am Nicole Golden. I am the Director of the Youth Prosperity and Security Initiative here at CSIS, run in partnership with the International Youth Foundation. And we're thrilled to welcome you all to our first big International Youth Day event here at CSIS. We're thrilled to have all of you here in the room, as well as um, the many of you we know are joining us online. We are very excited to be collaborating for this event with the United Nations Foundation and with the PLUS Social Good community. And we're just very excited to have um, that uh, aspect of our conversation as well. So by resolution, the United Nations affirmed August 12th to be International Youth Day, the first one being in the year 2000. And it was originally, the original intent was to galvanize activity and discussion around the UN World Program of Action on Youth. But in reality, inspired by that vision, it's become so much more. And I think it's become truly a global event to really do two things, to have thoughtful, important conversations around youth issues, and around young people in the landscape of global development, prosperity, and security, but also to celebrate young people and the incredible role that they continue to play as leaders in society today and what we know will be the ongoing important role of young people in society going forward. So our conversation today and this really dynamic event we have in store is going to do both of those things. We are going to think about using the official UN theme of youth migration and development, moving development forward, as a jumping off point. Um, we know young people account for as much as 30% of international migrants. And when you think about the countless number of young people moving within their countries, um, often from rural settings to urban settings, um, the, the policy implications of that, I think, for our communities, for our countries, um, for the world at large is really important. So we're going to talk about that um, with a really dynamic uh, policy and research panel with Mark Montgomery from the POP Council and Manuel Orozco from the Inter-American Dialogue. And then we're very lucky we're going to have Nancy Donaldson from the International Labor Organization um, talk to us and share some thoughts on employment and migration issues and then we're going to have, call it the, the DC premiere, if you will, of the winning video from ILO's Youth Migration and Employment Video Contest. Um, and then we're going to follow up that, um, that uh, winning video with taking those themes of, of the important role young people are playing in youth participation and young leadership into our practice panel that my colleague, Colm Quinn, is going to moderate. We're really going to have a dynamic conversation with two amazing um, young leaders, Ramona Dragomir and Manyang Rith here to talk about some of the issues um, in practice and participation and young leadership and activism around these issues. And um, that's going to be a really dynamic program. We know that there are many benefits to youth migration, bringing innovation, um, and cultural diversity to a number of cities, providing economic opportunity and often educational opportunity um, to those that, that move abroad and find those opportunities. But there's also challenges associated. Um, often that aspiration gap and, and that which those seek on the move um, is not met. And often young migrants in particular find themselves vulnerable to exploitation, to human rights abuses, um, to social exclusion. So we really want to have a thoughtful conversation today about how can we harness that opportunity, leverage the potential in young people on the move, as well as what are some of the policy and programmatic um, opportunities to address and mitigate some of the challenges associated um, with our young, mobile, and inspired uh, generation. Um, the likes of which we've never seen before. As many of you know, half the world's population is under the age of 30. So this is a really important conversation. Um, we're, again, really excited you all are here. For those of you that are in the room, um, our formal program is going to be immediately followed by a really exciting and, and, we hope, productive networking luncheon, where in addition to our speakers and panelists who uh, will be staying on as table hosts and hopefully carrying on some of the conversation, we'll start with our with our dialogues on stage, we have uh, a number of other special uh, guests joining us as table hosts as well. 
We have Rebecca Zilberman uh, from the British Council. We have Jessica Lazar from the United Nations Foundation. Uh, we're due to have Marianne Yerkes, a uh, youth coordinator from the US Agency for International Development. Uh, my colleague Kate Carpenter from the International Youth Foundation. And we have Sarah Sladen here from the Alliance for International Youth Development. So um, without further ado, um, it's really my very distinct pleasure, uh, before we move to our first panel discussion, to call up uh, a very uh, trusted colleague and a really a true youth champion, Aaron Sherinian, the Vice President of the for Communications from the United Nations Foundation, to say a few words. Aaron, please join us. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you to CSIS for your leadership and for convening us here today. It's a good rule of thumb that if you're in the same room where Nicole Golden is, you're probably in the right place. <laughs> and I definitely feel like that's the case today. On behalf of the United Nations Foundation and the partners of the Plus Social Good community, I wanted to just say a couple of words echoing what Nicole has said and calling for action. Action not only within this room among a really diverse group, an interesting group, a group of people who are dedicated to youth issues, but also a call to action to the many people, the thousands of people who are part of the Plus Social Good community. Young people have always been part of the conversation. They've been convened at different levels, they've been listened to at different levels. But we are underway and in the middle of a major moment in world history. The consultation around the Millennium Development Goals, how far we've gone, what we need to do. The consultation around the post-2015 this dialogue that's happening around what happens after 2015 for the world's development goals. Key issues like the issues related to migration that Nicole underlined today that affect everything related to security, our economy, and the kind of world we're in. The values of the world we're in, not just the way it works or what the metrics say, is underway. And we are at a point where the way that this generation, this new generation, connects allows for us to have a real and a robust conversation. Not just to nod to young people, not just to say, let's make sure there's a young person at the table, but to make sure that young people everywhere are part of that dialogue. The United Nations and the Secretary General, in a number of ways, both by appointing a special envoy for youth, both by what you've seen with the number of agencies from UNDP to UNFPA to the multiple UN agencies and partners who are truly engaging with young people, we know that the questions are just as important as the feedback and the answers. The question is being asked, what do youth care about? What are young people concerned about? What is keeping them up at night and what is galvanizing them forward by day? What are the things that young people want to make sure are on that global agenda? It's exciting to see initiatives like My World take place today where we're leveraging technology, where we're leveraging social media to not just say we know or think we know, but to actually poll and get the pulse of young people around the world. It's exciting to see things like the Plus Social Good community come around the table so that instead of being an afterthought or a nicety around UN meetings and convenings and important collaborations, where it's actually woven into the fabric of the decisions that are being made by world leaders and policymakers today. Nicole uh, made mention of this incredible statistic that I don't know if really people have absorbed yet, where 43% of the world is under the age of 25. 43% of the world is trying to figure out where they will go, those important migration questions we we we're going to talk about today, what kind of job they will have if they have one, the prospects for health. Of that 43%, there are women who want to know if they will live through childbirth. Of that 43%, there are women who want to know if they will be forced into marriage or not. Of that 43%, there are people who want to know, will I have the ability to actually influence my government's decisions, or will I just be part of this game that seems to be played all the time? Will there be transparency and accountability? That 43% of the world that's under the age 25 is talking about this. And it's called a couple of different things. I've heard that generation called the now generation, where they're worried about what's in front of them because of social media and technology. So be it. There's urgency to that now generation. I've heard that generation called the connected generation. In fact, our friends at Mashable often times refer to this generation as the connected generation because they know that they can just as easily connect with someone in Uganda or in Australia as they can with someone living in Brazil or Bangalore. They know that that connection is real and is robust. I've heard the generation called something, and Nicole reminded me of it when she called this, this generation an inspired generation. This is the purpose generation. It's a generation full of purpose. Who knows that not just when they make it, 
when they make it big, when they're successful in the marketplace, will they be dedicated to global issues? These are people, young people, who are part of the global issues dialogue and who want to work with the UN, who want to work with their local governments from day one. We know, in fact, if you read statistics from, uh, from Pew and from other institutes, that here in the United States and in many parts of the world, young people will consider giving back philanthropy, global engagement, as what they do from the beginning, from their first paycheck, and well before they even join the workforce, from what they're doing in college from what they're doing through their high school studies. So that purposeful generation, that generation of purpose, that now generation that wants to know information and have generation, information quicker than ever, and that connected generation that has real purposeful dialogue across the globe in real time is the generation that can tackle the tough issues. We're grateful for you for being part of that. We know that in the, uh, by use of the, of the hashtag Youth Day, am I getting that right? By youth, hash Youth Day, we know that questions are coming in. And so let's take the folks up on their promise here today, the people who were sit in these beautiful chairs in gorgeous Washington, D.C., here at CSIS. Let's take them up on that promise. Let's ask them questions. Let's listen to the questions. And let's make sure that we're getting responses out to them. Let's utilize that now, that connectivity, and that purpose to make sure that we're tackling the right questions, getting the right feedback, and making sure that the world doesn't just think that it's listening to young people, that indeed it's a young dialogue. Congratulations to all of you. Thanks again to CSIS, and happy International Youth Day. Great. Thank you so much, Aaron. You can easily see why we have a a very excited uh, collaborative spirit here in the room today. So with that, we're going to keep this conversation going. Um, again, as we see some folks trickling in, there are a few seats here in the front uh, for those coming in. No need to stand in the back. Um, and we're going to get going with our first conversation. So I'd be delighted to welcome up with me to, uh, to have a few words, Mark Montgomery from the Population Council and Manuel Orozco from the Inter-American Dialogue. Everyone mics on? Great. Well, great. So to my left, just by way of uh, introductions, and we all have uh, biographies in front of us, so we won't spend uh, too much time, um, but Man Manuel Orozco from the Inter-American Dialogue, and to his left, Mark Montgomery from uh, the Population Council. And we're going to get right into it. Um, Manuel, as we start to dive into this research and policy conversation, you have a new book that's just come out about um, my remittances and migration in the context of development. Can you start us off with um, just an overview from your research and your perspective on some of the numbers and some of the key trends, particularly um, in the context of young people? Sure. Um, you know, w w one way to think about youth migrants is to you know, put it in the broader context. I think right now we are, we are um, in, the, in the turning point in, in the global context where we are at the tail end of the international wave of migration that started in the 1970s with the beginning of a new wave. In between that, at the intersection of that, are youth migrants uh, that come from completely or almost completely different backgrounds. The generation that we have been working with is basically one that is characterized by labor-intensive work. Um, if we're talking about people between 15, 16 to 25, um, about, I think UNICEF says 17% of them uh, are part of the international migrant uh, population. Within the context of, um, of remittances, uh, this population basically is about 12% of all migrants. So there is not much of a, a big difference between the two. Now, um, these migrants, uh, for the most part, tend to be much more vulnerable than the rest of the uh, older cohorts. For example, they earn an income that is about 20% lower than the average income of immigrants, which is already pretty low. Uh, migrants in the industrialized countries and even in some uh, non-emerging economies uh, are at the lowest uh, income sector in, in society. In the United States, for example, the average income of an immigrant is about $26,000 a year. And immigrants under 25 earn 20% less than that. 
they also um, have paradoxically uh, lower levels of education. Uh, people with tertiary education uh, in that age group is relatively lower than those who are over 25. In addition to that, in terms of their financial capability, they also have uh, much more, they're more, much more vulnerable. Uh, a smaller percentage of them is able to save, to mobilize, uh, to create and mobilize savings, and the amounts of uh, funds saved is relatively smaller. The average immigrant, 60% uh, of immigrants, for example, save, are able to save at about $4,000. This is in Europe and the United States. The people under 25 earn probably uh, $2,500. So th there is actually a paper I distributed that have some of those statistics just to, as a reference. So they are definitely a relatively vulnerable group. And there are certain groups that are important to pay attention. Uh, for example, uh, those working in construction, domestic workers, among others, fall into this category of greater vulnerability. Um, another important issue to think about um, migrant youth it's, it's one we, we do take for granted by virtue of being young, but it's the fact that they are basically at the first stage of their life cycle. If we think of um, our personal lives as part of a series of cycles, we have five cycles. The first one is between 16, 15 to 25. Then there is another cycle that goes from 25, 35, more or less, then 35 to 50, 50 to 65, and then uh, is you, you know, your encounter with God or anything else you want to find. But um, <coughs> for this young cohort, <coughs> there is a, a, a lesser lack of understanding of their prospects to the future mm -hmm. because they are more concentrated on, on the now. You know, what you were talking about before, the problem is that in this day and age, the now practically doesn't exist. Uh, because we've lived in this age of liquid times, of liquidity, where everything changes at such a very fast speed that um, it's impossible to catch up with things. And as you try to catching up, uh, the more vulnerable you are, the more difficult it is to face the changes that are coming across to you on a regular basis. And this is one of the major challenges that young migrants face. So, um, you know, they send money like anybody else, uh, they, but they sent also less money by virtue of their income, mm -hmm. but also the years of being uh, as a migrant, which is shorter than the years that um, the older populations do. Why do they migrate? There are basically <coughs> about four or five reasons. I mean, one is they are part of the decision-making process in the household that chooses to send the youngest and strongest and more capable to work abroad. Second, because they came with their families, because the family decided to migrate and they were under five, six years of age. The third reason is that there is an, a substantial foreign labor demand in the industrialized economies, in the emerging economies, for certain population groups that are under 25. Domestic work is one of them, and construction workers is another one. Mm -hmm. And the fourth reason is that there is still this uh, risk of um, acceptance spirit among many people who want to see the world and, and face uh, life. So those are the four groups, more or less. It's really helpful, and we're going to dive back into some of these issues in a little more detail, in particular um, the links between some of the issues young people as migrants face and how that links into kind of their overall youth development, as you started talking about and then what that means for policy. But picking up on one of the points you mentioned about some of the, the more vulnerable groups within um, the youth migrants group, I'm really delighted that we have uh, Mark with us here. Uh, Mark with, was a co-author of a recent report that came out called Girls on the Move, um, looking at adolescent girls' uh, migration in the developing world as part of the Girls mm -hmm. Count series. And uh, certainly within the more vulnerable groups um, when it comes to migration, um, adolescent girls are certainly um, one that we should spend a little more time talking about. So, so Mark, with that, can you tell us a little bit more about the background to the report? Why okay. was this um, important for um, Population Council um, with Nike and the UN Foundation mm. to, to do this deep research on? Um, and then in particular, 
What were some of the key questions you looked to address? And then, of course, we'll get into some, what were some of the answers you right. found? Right. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, I, I do want to begin by thanking the UN Foundation and the Nike Foundations for supporting our, our report uh, very generously. Uh, and they were really engaged uh, in every step of the process. And we've uh, benefited greatly from that uh, interaction. So our report is about um, girls who migrate uh, at young ages, as uh, adolescents, uh, from rural villages, other cities and towns, within their own countries, uh, to city destinations. So we focused for, uh, uh, I think, reasons that will uh, uh, be understandable to everyone in the room, on adolescent girls. Um, those girls are making choices, or having choices made for them that can either open up their life prospects in a, a positive and, and dynamic way or foreclose options, uh, possibly forever. So it's a critical uh, moment in, in life. Um, and it's surprising that one of the key choices facing girls and their families has been uh, so little studied that it's, it's really shocking. Um, that is the choice about where to live. You know, a, a, any girl, any adolescent, a boy or, or girl, will naturally think of the future and ask, you know, where, where should I live? And what sort of place should I be that will allow my potential to flower? Uh, and it would be natural for uh, uh, girls of this age to think of cities and towns as potential destinations. Because after all, those are the places where um, resources are concentrated. Uh, you have more diverse labor markets than is true in the countryside. Uh, you have opportunities for uh, furthering schooling and making use of those, those skills. You have uh, health care available at levels that's not easy to find in, in the countryside. Um, and we spoke before about um, uh, important moments in, in history. Uh, as you probably know, uh, in the last few years, the world's population as a whole has tipped from majority rural to majority urban. And in the next 10, 15, 20 years, most poor countries will make that transition as well. So we're entering an era that is historically unprecedented. We've never been here uh, before. Uh, so we wanted to ask, what are the implications uh, for girls, for their lives, uh, for the opportunities they're able to uh, secure, and also what are the implications in terms of the risks uh, and disadvantages and uh, the risks of, of exclusion in particular. So we tried to take a very even-handed approach, looking not only at the, the risks and dangers that come with internal migration, uh, and most of the literature has fixated on these risks and dangers. Uh, most of the literature has not looked uh, with equal intensity at the opportunities, the, the factors that drive migration, uh, the search for, for uh, a better life. Right? So we tried to look at both in an in even-handed way. Um, and we divided the report into the stages of a girl's journey. Um, what is known uh, uh, before uh, she embarks? Uh, what happens along the way in the journey from one place to another? And thirdly, uh, the stage of arrival, settling in, and uh, we hope uh, a stage of prospering in, in uh, city or town destinations. So what we were able to find, the report is full of you know, statistics, and I know we'll want to uh, talk a bit about how we know what we know. Um, but let me just give you one uh, uh, bit of that, of that flavor. If I'm talking about internal migration, okay, probably you have in your mind an image of the kind of journey that that uh, entails from a rural village to a city or town. That's a misconception. Right? There is more internal migration from cities and towns to other cities and towns these days than from rural villages to urban destinations. Right? So, and the literature, in fact, has, has not really I'm speaking of the academic, the program, uh, intervention, the policy literature has not understood this uh, demographic reality. Right? So increasingly, as the world as a whole, as developing countries as a group are becoming more and more urban, more of the migration will take place from one urban setting to another. And we know so little about uh, the girls who undertake that kind of journey. 
there's, um, I would challenge you to find three papers, three articles uh, that, that ask that basic question. What does it mean to go from one city or town at this young age of, of adolescence? Um, we did find for each of the three stages of the journey, we found promising interventions underway in, in poor countries. There are uh, and countries such as Cambodia, for example. There are interventions that work with girls in the countryside, in that case, to try to educate them about what lies ahead. You know, if they choose to move, they should do so with knowledge of what that move is going to entail. How do you find work? Where, where does one go? How do you avoid uh, exploitative uh, 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 situations in terms of the, the workplace? Where is it safe to live? And how do you get from here uh, to there? I mean, basic information. But let's face it, rural girls in particular often embark without being equipped with uh, that kind of, of knowledge. Right? They also may leave without um, uh, identity cards and other ways of reestablishing themselves in, in their new destinations. Right? So they need to be equipped um, and prepared uh, before they leave with assets uh, whether those are uh, in the form of identity cards or uh, other kinds of assets that help them get established in their destinations. In the, the journey along the way, um, this too is very uh, much understudied. Um, we think of uh, uh, the migration journey as one that is fraught with risk and, and danger, and it certainly is for some girls. Uh, there's certainly the, the risks of sexual exploitation, trafficking, those are real risks. But they are not risks that are part of the common migration experience. Right? So yes, those risks are real. Yes, they need a lot of policy attention. Um, but we also should strive to see the, the broader picture. Right? Uh, so in particular, um, when girls move internally, um, they do not typically move by themselves. Uh, they move in groups with relatives, with um, employers or intermediaries who are, uh, in principle, going to see to it that they are established on, on arrival. Right? There are points, um, uh, for example, uh, uh, transit depots, train stations, and so forth, that are points of peril for some girls. But those are also uh, points where programs can, can uh, uh, target themselves. There is, um, for example, in China, there's a massive program known as Spring Rain. Uh, which has focused on train stations and seeing to it that when girls arrive, that they are met, that they are equipped with literature, that they are given a sense of what, what lies to head, where, where to go in the city, uh, who to contact, and, and so forth. And then finally on arrival, uh, again, girls have, um, uh, a migrant girl, any migrant, has a lot to figure out in a, in a new city uh, destination. Um, how to find safe housing, work, uh, schooling, and, and so forth. Um, we don't know much about that settling in process. We do see in our, our report that girls who, who uh, leave for the city hoping to further their schooling often succeed in enrolling in school and, and building their human capital assets. So that's one way in which migration, while it uh, uh, is, uh, can be a risky and even dangerous situation for some girls. It also opens opportunities uh, for those girls to, to build the assets they'll need for a lifetime. So just to, to quickly follow up, um, and then I want to turn back to uh, Manuel for some uh, follow-up thoughts. One of the points that struck me on, Manuel gave us an, an overview of some of the reasons why young people are migrating in the first place. Mm. I mean, just taking a step back, um, the, the report opens up and points out how, in some cases, um, education or employment um, may not be the, the first driver, if you will, um, of girls' migration, um, in, which is different than the general case we tend to see uh, maybe with, with adolescent boys. Um, an interesting statistic in the report is that um, over 40% of adolescent girl migrants in Pakistan, um, the, the mm. root of their migration is for marriage. Mm. So um, just if you can just give us a sort of quick, again, stepping back um, to your comments on what you found that maybe differentiation between male and female youth mm -hmm. um, 
in their sort of drive to move in the first place. And some of that may be both, you know, sort of voluntary um, or involuntary. Mm -hmm. um, but we'd we'll love a little more color on that from you. Right. I think you know, girls and boys move, generally speaking, for the same kinds of reasons. Um, uh, in general, if the most general, for uh, better opportunities, but specifically for work, um, for schooling. And in some cases, they move in anticipation or for marriage, uh, they, they will say. But it turns out that the Pakistan example that you cited is a bit of, of an exception. Um, by far, the majority, the vast majority of girls who move between the ages of 15 to 19, uh, they move while they're still unmarried. Some are doing so, for example, in Ethiopia, um, to avoid the risks of early marriage, that, that um, the kinds of arrangements that would be foisted upon them in the countryside. Right? So migration for them is an escape route to uh, avoid uh, too early marriage. Now that's interesting. And so turning back to you, Manuel, in, in your work, um, Mark mentioned a few of the, the policy and the programmatic um, interventions that they've seen as being successful. Um, what have you come across as, as in your work as seeing as the, the foundational links between migration and the needs of youth migrants and their overall youth development? And you talked about you know, that this is the first of their stage of their sort of life cycle and they're entering into adulthood. What have you seen, what have you come across or just in your mind as you see as fundamental if we think about the policy um, approach to this? I mean, the, the, quick, uh, the quick answer will be security and asset building. Mm -hmm. um, let me just sort of interject and clarify on something. The, the, there is a distinction between the, the report that you are doing and the work I've been doing, because my work is mostly on international mm -hmm. migration. Um, and the report that you're working, you worked on is mostly uh, within countries, exactly. but, but what is really relevant and very connected here mm -hmm. is the nature of which the migration occurring um, in terms of the city, the human mm -hmm. mobility mm -hmm. across cities. As the world has become more urbanized, this notion of rural urban migration is declining mm -hmm. significantly. Mm -hmm. And this operates at the, at the global level, transnationally or nationally. And we've seen it um, in different contexts. And, and I think um, one point of agreement we could have, too, is that the dangers, while they exist, there is a substantial rationale uh, um, condition that explains this migration of, youngers, uh, of young people, which is mostly with their families. Mm. Uh, a lot of it occurs, whether it is within the country or internationally, there is a substantive percentage of people who mo move uh, with their relatives, with their parents. Um, now, the exposure to those dangers may be may vary, and this takes you, you know, to the foundational issues that you can think of. If um, you know, I think you can think of facts, uh, issues to problematize, and policy solutions to to certain issues. When we are looking at uh, young migrants, um, there are a range of issues to problematize. One of them is the victim syndrome, mm. that all young migrants are victims. The second one is that those people who migrate left someone behind, as if you're abandoning your relatives, and that's not the case. There are other issues to problematize that um, you know, everybody is exposed to uh, dangers that are quite life-threatening, um, and, and so on. Um, the another that I worked also you know, with remittance recipients, families of migrants. Um, you know, the average household that receives remittances is about five people. At least two in five are under 25, and perhaps more, uh, depending on what region of the world you're working with. And th this also geographic distinction is quite important mm. because one thing is to talk about certain parts of Asia, for example, than to talk about Latin America or um, even Africa. You know, in Africa, not everybody uh, lives under these arranged marriages. Um, and so th those, those dynamics really matter when it comes to, to this issue. But what is really uh, a common thread here is that um, there is a level of security or insecurity that you are exposed to <coughs> by virtue of the fact that you are <coughs> in the younger levels and you have less 
social protection, less of a social safety net. And if your parents uh, migrated with you uh, and who are coming without papers, which is a significant number uh, today, then you, they will be more exposed to these vulnerabilities. The second one is your material circumstances. Yeah. You know, what are the key issues of your material circumstances? Well, um, you're not able to build sufficient assets. So from a policy perspective, the outlook that one needs to have is how to help these young migrants to understand how to build assets over time and how to think of those assets as a function of their personal goals in the short and the long term. And those are not easy issues to deal with. Um, but at least you can lay out uh, a baseline of policy approaches to deal with regards to safety, you know, understanding your uh, human and labor rights, for example. Uh, this is a fundamental issue, whether it's urban uh, migration, na domestic migration, or international migration. And the other one is how to build assets over time. And, and that one for a young cohort is, is substantially and tremendously important because the more vulnerable, if you are more vulnerable than other people and yet you are younger, your capacity to, to move out of that vulnerability will be more difficult if you are not giving tools to deal with them. And your life expectancy, your, your quality of life uh, will be much lower uh, in the longer term. And this is a problem that we see with many migrants today uh, who migrated at the age of 18, 19, 10 years later, they are still basically working in the same job. Uh, their income hasn't increased more than 10% in 10 years, and their prospects of returning are relatively dim because the opportunity cost of returning is usually uh, uh, not too attractive to them. It's really interesting. I think you know the 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 points about financial inclusion and asset building and as part of broader economic opportunity is is very reflective of the conversation that many of us are having around and thinking around young people sort of globally when we think about um, the youth unemployment crisis um, and how we can build a broader world of economic opportunity by thinking about not only income generating activities but how we promote youth savings, youth, in, youth financial inclusion and, and general asset building. So it's interesting that um, in the context of youth migration, that this issue in particular becomes quite relevant. Mark, you mentioned um, the idea of how do we know what we know, and that's something that struck me uh, both in the report and, and Manuel and some of your work, um, which is to say, I think from what I've seen in the youth migration space, like many of the areas of youth well-being and youth development, um, we have data gaps. Um, we don't have a lot of age disaggregated data. Um, we don't necessarily have as much evidence around what works uh, from a policy and programmatic perspective. So we'd like to take this opportunity to get your thoughts on wh how we know what we know. Um, what in your mind are some of the key sort of research and policy research questions that we need to answer such that we can really drive evidence-based policy making and, and better address the needs and, and leverage the opportunities in youth migrants. So Manuel, I'm going to start with you and ask you to give your thoughts on that, and then we'll go to Well, work. I mean, if you ask a researcher or an academic, <laughs> data gaps is yes, like, that's, you know, oh, that's great. Where do I, how much time do I have? <laughs> the, what I can tell you is the following, is that data operates as a function of the assumptions that you make about life and issues. When it comes to youth, um, the focus has been on the dangers and mm. the future and their position. When it comes to migrant youth, there has been very little work done. Um, and whenever there is a study, most of the studies are done on the assumption that young migrants are in danger mm. and the studies focus on that. And oftentimes there is a bias. The, it's an important area of work, but one of the problems that I find is that the analysis and the policy practice with regards to the intersection between migration and development is very, very limited. And partly because there is very little data. And partly it's because the assumptions that exist in forming the intersection between migration and development are almost nil. 
because most of your assumption is that migration is perhaps not good. Mm -hmm. um, and so your research, your analysis is not informed by those dynamics. Plus, you know, in the context of nation states and migration policies, you don't want to show evidence, substantive evidence all the time that there is a positive relationship to migration and development that cuts across different levels. And that the more transnationalized a society is, and, and this is really important with the young cohorts, is that transnational young people are actually drivers of major global change mm -hmm. at different levels. One of them is identity, diasporic identity, which is an issue that is not even addressed and yet is taking a significant relevance today. And governments don't want to talk about it. Don't, don't they, you, know, you always swing, look at the debate in Congress right now. Um, the DREAM Act is not even a dream right now, it's a nightmare. Um, so uh, when it comes to data, there is still a lot of work. I think you know, the point of the partner is not to, to do more research at this point, but to have a baseline and a consensus on what are the key assumptions we need to think about, we need mm -hmm. to problematize, and then move to the next step, and which type of stakeholders to insert, because oftentimes you have a monopoly of data. For example, UNICEF, sometimes the, you know, they are the data people when it comes to youth. And mm -hmm. that may have implications, you know, when it comes to uh, testing, for example, in education. Yeah, yeah. I really uh, very much agree with what you were just saying. Uh, what, what we know depends on the framework that we, we bring to the problem. And I think you're absolutely right that where migration is concerned, whether it's internal or international, the frame has been risk and danger. Right? And that's part of the story, but that's by no means the full picture. Uh, there are uh, the state of, of, of knowledge about adolescent migration, whether for girls or for boys. It's the kind of knowledge that, uh, well, let's sit back a second. Adolescence is a, a period of life where there are many events and decisions. Right? What we know about adolescents, in particular uh, adolescent migrants, comes from, as it were, snapshots of different girls at different stages of adolescence. Right? Whereas what we need to know is what happens to an individual girl as she makes her passage through adolescence. Right? And so one uh, fundamental data gap is the lack of that kind of information, uh, uh, studies that actually follow girls, whether they migrate or, or choose not to migrate, uh, but follow them through adolescence to understand what risks, what actual risks befall them um, how resilient they are, uh, who's resilient and who is not. Um, we simply lack that, that fundamental information. And it is um, uh, a commentary, I think, on the, on the literature that, as Manuel mentioned, UNICEF, uh, the data provider, the, the go-to uh, <laughs> organization for uh, much of what we know about uh, child and adolescent uh, well-being. Um, Many of you in, in the room will know that they, uh, UNICEF sponsors uh, a very important program of surveys known as the Multiple Indicator Cluster Surveys. Much of what we know about adolescent life is, is it comes uh, to us by virtue of those surveys. Um, there have been four, now five rounds of surveys. The number of questions asked about migration over the whole, zero. So we cannot, with these very valuable sources of information, know who is a migrant, internal or international, and, and who's not. Right? So that tells you something about how migration has been seen in, in the literature. And it has not been given the priority that I think uh, it's essential to give it. Well, on that note, that's actually a, a nice ending point. Believe it or not, our, our conversation has quickly come to, it's come to an end. Um, and I think what we've hopefully started to do here is just tip the iceberg with some of the questions, some of the dialogue. Um, we hope it will keep happening online um, using uh, the, the Youth Day hashtag um, and that our colleagues and organizations like you will continue this conversation. And hopefully we've just, as I said, scratched the surface but brought some of these issues to light. So thank you, Mark and Manuel. Uh, for joining us and sharing some of your thoughts and 
I know some of your work is available outside, and, and we'll uh, look forward to, to more of it in the future. Thank you Thank both you. very, very much. You. Happy International Youth Day. <laughs> Thank you. Um, again, uh, thanks to, to Manuel and Mark and starting to share some of those thoughts. And I think that also really sets up um, our, our next conversation on moving into some of the practice and what some, uh, in particular, some young leaders and some young activists are doing to uh, drive and uh, make change within their communities and, and with their peers. Uh, but before we get to that panel, I'm very delighted uh, to introduce and for all of us to hear from Nancy Donaldson, uh, the director of the International Labor Organization's Washington office, who's going to share some thoughts with us on um, the ILO's research um, and policies around youth, and particularly youth employment when it comes to um, young migrants. And then uh, we're going to have the DC premiere, if you will, of the winning video, um, which uh, from their, their youth employment video contest that Nancy's gonna tell us more about. So without further ado, Nancy, please join us. So glad you're here, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me, Nicole, and for the UN Foundation support and uh, for this day. Uh, I'm really hoping that, and I saw a list of who's here, that so many of you are here because you're working on these issues. You're not only interested, but you're working or you're thinking about going into work on these issues. And that's really important because uh, it's such an interesting bundle of challenges and it's absolutely critical. Uh, critical for different reasons in different places, as you probably know. Uh, the ILO fundamentally, and our director, our succeeding directors have said for a long time that the best way out of poverty is a job. And in many places it's thought of as a livelihood. Okay. <laughs> um, and so, and, and for youth, that's incredibly important because they're at the beginning of their lifetime of work, we hope. We want, we want to promote. And we know, and uh, the colleagues were saying this a little bit, that if they, if they get off track, if they get disconnected from work, if they don't learn the skills of being employed of any kind of work, young people can so quickly get off track and never really quite get engaged about being an employed person or, and a person with a livelihood, an entrepreneur, uh, uh, someone who is a family provider. It happens um, far too quickly. And then instead of maybe thinking what to do when you're retiring, you have 50 years of productive life that may be off track. So for this, this is a very serious issue for governments, for the UN system, for multilateral um, organizations. And I'm gonna talk to you a tiny bit about that just to not let you know how we're mobilizing. But this is like, no kidding. <laughs> And so it's very wonderful to hear people like Mark talk about what, what you're doing in your world with individuals and groups and communities um, because this is not something that governments are going to solve, that the UN or the ILO are going to be able to uh, take on. It's really a collaboration. It's really a collective thing that the private sector, the, the, the unions, the the different um, community-based and family-based um, initiatives have to be a part of. Um, and so, thank you that you started out with that, and I know we'll get back to that. So, um, let me say that I have some good news. I don't know if Manuel had to leave, but uh, in fact, we are working on a, um, a, a report that is about to come out which is focused on the question of migration and youth. It's not going to be super long, but we have been learning some interesting things. And since our um, uh, International Labor Conference, um, we did an outreach to about 45 or 50 countries um, and engagements last year and came to our international conference and uh, adopted uh, a declaration about youth employment 
and that it was an urgent top priority for governments to deal with in the many different ways that it shows up. And, um, and let me just say in the UN system, probably you know, it's in, it's in our uh, DG statement today, which is out on the uh, table, that there is a UNGA special assembly meeting uh, during the UNGA, I assume, is a high-level dialogue on the international migration and development that's going to take place in uh, October. So we see this coming up higher in the priorities of thinking about how do we help the youth and how do the youth help us? Because we're trying to get the uh, economy <laughs> back on track, a better recovery, a more real recovery. Okay, and so let me just mention a couple of things. I was in rural Canada last week driving along as far away from this issue as you can imagine. And a story comes on the BBC about what to do about Egypt. And it was kind of a documentary and radio documentary going through and interviewing people on the street. And what, is, what were they worried about? So many youth, so many educated people unemployed and without uh, access. And they interviewed someone from the current government who said, we have a solution. We're going to have a lot of our people go work in Libya on reconstruction. That was the answer. That worried me. <laughs> it worried me for a lot of reasons because the labor exploitation issues are big. So there are places like here in the United States and in Spain and in Egypt and in places around the world where there's huge unemployment issues and the economies aren't working. But there are also places where there is a great need for migrant uh, workers are a great need for workers of some kind and there are some places and uh, I was thinking my colleague uh, from Vietnam who was working on I think it's Vietnam <laughs> how we got it right in this huge fisheries industry and they worry about human trafficking about young uh, boys 15 or so being trafficked uh, kind of kidnapped and trafficked to be brought to work on the fishing boats because there's nobody to do the work and so they entrap them and then they keep them there and they can do that pretty successfully if they're into that kind of criminal activity because they don't really have exposure to regular society. So we have this thing on different ends. We have very qualified people looking for jobs and migrating for a better opportunity and we have situations where people are being exploited because the labor market and the workforce isn't working. And that's, and that's why it's a big mix of issues and it's not the same issue everywhere. My, I'll just mention one other story. My colleague from Addis, Ethiopia, told me there are 1,000 recruiting agencies in just that city exporting mostly young girls. Um, I, I hope they're uh, of an age where they could be working legally to do domestic work in the Middle East. And so what are we worrying about the ILO? We're worrying about are they being educated, some of the things that you mentioned, Mark, about their rights? Are they being educated about where to connect with authorities in the receiving countries? And is the country doing their job to help make sure that this is a regulated industry? There are protections for these girls who are seeping really possibly fantastic opportunities, but it's sketchy, as my daughter would say. <laughs> it's a little sketchy. Um, I want to be one of the people who signs up to Nicole's uh, title. Our, our focus is, you know, reaping the benefits and minimizing the risks. And so I think we're all talking about both. But I do want to say from our new report, some of the things that, that we're finding in our data, which I find quite exciting and just want to say this is part of it, is the benefits. Have we talked much about the benefits? We have. Okay, I won't overdo it. <laughs> um, so, you know, when, you, when population growth dips and you don't have youth coming up, they need youth, they need workers. Um, and so we have the possibility of, of, with good migration policies and good support and good training, of, of helping the world balance where there aren't enough people to do the work in great aging populations and from places where people need work. Um, but that match is, is critical. Um, the, uh, the studies are coming out, and we're certainly seeing some of this in the U.S. in the immigration debate, that the negative effect of migration on wages and employment for national, uh, national level statistics 
are negligible. Very, very low level of impact. It's, it's another, it's a myth that we really need to understand and we're studying because let's, let's figure it out. Let's know what the answer is on this. Let's not look, be just purely threatened. Um, another thing is, and this might make sense intuitively, is that migration helps improve what we say labor market efficiencies helping close gaps and, and creating more balance within societies. Now, one thing that you mentioned, um, and I'll just say, from our studies that are coming back right now, three-fourths of migration is domestic. It's not across regions. So we're not talking about this mass movement of people influx, going influx into new regions. The largest amount, uh, largest 30% is in Asia. 19% uh, is in North America. Uh, I think it's, uh, it was 29% in the European Union and only 14% and in Africa and only 39 in Latin America and the Caribbean. So that might not be numbers that you would expect. Um, uh, of course, we all have studied, like, at least from the institutions you all come from, <laughs> remittances and the incredible importance of remittances for helping uh, better distribution, better prosperity in a broader world. Um, and the issue of brain drain and brain gain is still very real. We have incredibly well-trained youth um, coming to places and, and great benefits happening. And sometimes brain drain is, uh, can affect a community. Um, and, uh, okay, so those are some of the good things, and we need to talk more about those. I also want to say what we're finding in our new study, which we don't have out on the table yet because we have to finalize it, but they said I could share it because this is International Youth Day. Um, and that is that for migrating educated workers, um, it's harder to get jobs, these higher paying, higher skilled jobs national and, and it's just it's showing up in all kinds of places it's also true for women and the higher skilled it is the percentages are a little tougher for people migrating so the issues of discrimination are not just about exploitation they're about uh, decent work and and uh, access to opportunity for everybody and so that needs work all right so I probably went on long enough let me talk to you about and I love to talk to everyone I get to um, about this subject. I have two daughters, a 17-year-old and a 19-year-old, and it's all I think about. <laughs> um, and it's, uh, they're learning that it's not only the U.S. where there are challenges to get jobs and internships and everything. So one of the things ILO has done, in addition to really work on helping develop policies for interventions for these different kinds of issues, and working with our member countries and unions and businesses to create uh, strategies together, is we're also trying to engage more with the youth. We've got more direct input, not just from our normal um, partners. And one of the ways we did this was this video contest. And we did one last year too, by the way, and we have that to show if we, if we have time later, on the question of decent work for youth. But this is about uh, labor migration. And there were 40 uh, submissions, and they're actually unveiling it in New York at a different uh, event today with the, the filmmaker. Um, and it, uh, so it was produced by uh, Laura Garciandia. Garciandia, did I say it correctly? She's 27 years old, and she won first place in the contest. Um, and the title of her film, which is not super long, but it might be more interesting than just spe uh, talking heads, so I hope you'll enjoy this, um, is Reaping the Benefits, Minimizing the Risks. It is the, it is the, um, and then her, her title is Help Them Get There. So maybe we should roll it? Estando aquí fuimos a trabajar 
ayer, ¿verdad? ayer, imagínense, les vamos a contar una historia. Fuimos a trabajar tirando losas de tres plantas y no nos pagaron. ¿No les pagaron? No nos pagaron. No. Entonces, ¿en qué estamos? Eh, es verdad, eh, somos inmigrantes, pero somos seres humanos, ¿no? Hombre. Necesitamos, necesitamos por lo menos, este para ganar el dinero para que es que sea yo ando, con mi, yo ando con mi hermana ahí está ella no habíamos ah, ni la comido, vi, la vi no, habíamos ahora. Ni, no habíamos ni comido el, des, de digamos de días antes y así lo vinieron a traer nosotros fuimos claro y nos dijeron que le iban a dar desayuno amor y cena no Halo. llegamos y solo le dieron un, un pan ¿no? solo un pan el desayuno y un refresco eso fue todo y hasta las 2 de la tarde nosotros le, le decimos que teníamos hambre para seguir avanzando nos dijeron que hasta que termináramos, íbamos a terminar hasta las 6 de la tarde y todo el día no habíamos comido, Entonces, tenemos, que, tenemos que abrirlos, ¿no? tenemos que decidirlos, venirlos y lo salieron con 50 pesos para los eh, cuatro, para los cuatro Ay, que habíamos no. muchas veces un plato de comida, una cama, un techo lo salva de tener que dedicarse a cualquier otra actividad por obtener eso ¿a qué se dedican niños? a ¿Quién? mostrar a lustrar. ¿Cuántos años tienen? Diez. Diez. ¿Diez? Y once. ¿Once? Diez. ¿Ustedes quisieran ir algún día a Estados Unidos? Sí. ¿Sí? ¿A, ¿A qué quieren ir a Estados Unidos? Trabajar. Trabajar. ¿Qué les gustaría trabajar de grande? Carpintero. ¿Y usted? Trabajar leña. Encargar leña. Yo para... ¿Y hacer casa? Yo para hacer campo. El campo, pero para eso no tienen que ir a Estados Unidos. Basura. Acá lo pueden hacer. La basura es. Ayúdalos a llegar. Es una iniciativa ciudadana, más bien. No somos una ONG, somos un grupo de personas que nos ocupa y nos preocupa el tema de la migración. albergues funcionan como estancias temporales de todos los migrantes que cruzan hacia el norte. Ellos brindan comida, brindan asistencia de cualquier tipo, inclusive asistencia legal, de derechos humanos. No, pues lo mejor es la aventura. Lo mejor es la aventura. Lo difícil son las aguantadas de hambre que no se en este camino. Y también lo difícil que no se viene en este camino por la situación de su país, situación económica, política. Es... Eh, soy, de, soy de Honduras, departamento de Cortés, municipio de Villanueva. Eh, tengo 16 años. Voy, voy rumbo a Estados Unidos, mi primera vez. Voy, voy realmente por buscar a mi papá, aunque él no me ayuda ni... No sé ni el número de él, pero yo voy en busca de él. Tal vez lo logro encontrar. Y voy también por, por ir a buscar trabajo allá, mejor oportunidades. ¿Y la escuela? ¿Ah? ¿La escuela? Mm, que se pongan pilas. ¿Pilas con qué? Trabajar, trabajar. Los niños no trabajan. Los niños estudian. <ríe> no trabajan. Estudiar. Estudiar. Muchas veces ellos vienen viajando semanas, otros vienen viajando meses. Ahí es de hacer una denuncia pública de las situaciones que violan los derechos humanos de los migrantes, vincular a las personas con otras organizaciones o instituciones que sí puedan asumir la, la representación. Y pues de verdad, el fondo de mi corazón, les agradezco todo lo que hacen por nosotros y por un techo que nos dan donde descansar. Muchas gracias. No hay razón ni lógica en mi corazón Entra en mi vida, te abro la puerta Sé que en tus brazos ya no habrá noches desiertas Entra en mi vida todos nos identifiquemos unos a otros como lo que somos, seres humanos, sin importar nuestro origen, nuestra formación, nuestras características. Yo creo que, que eso haría que, pues que viviéramos en un mundo mejor. 
Después de este tiempo juntos, no quiero volver atrás. Después de este tiempo juntos, no quiero volver atrás. Thank you. Um, so just two points to leave you with. Um, in, in May 2013, we published um, a global youth trends, employment trends report. And we have a piece of paper out there with our Director General's statement about youth, uh, International Youth Employment Day. But we want you to know, if you really want to get a baseline about what are the trends going on, go to that link and check it out. And we're working on more data. Second thing I want to say is there are many international labor standards. We're a standard setting institution. There are many protections that protect uh, uh, youth around the world and migrant youth. And so if you're interested and you're a scholar or a researcher, make sure you're checking out those international labor standards and what they say about protecting youth because we have structures to act on if we make this a priority, which is what we're trying to do. The last thing I want to say just about in the United States and other places, um, not enough places, even if you have no papers, you are an illegal immigrant and you are in the United States, if you work, you are entitled to your pay. You are entitled to basic protections in the United States. And so I see a film like this and I think I'm so excited about it that group that is working about telling the workers their rights, because that's a really big part of it, that they need to know that they can go and demand their wages. Um, and that's something that we, the ILO, think is so important worldwide um, that ultimately the worker voice is going to be at the core of changing this. And, and teenagers, I have to say, from great experience, usually do have voice. <laughs> so let's encourage them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nancy. It's Again, it was really important for us uh, as part of our conversation today to have so many different stakeholders at the table from the academic community, the foundation community, of course, the, the ILO um, and the UN community, and of course, um, young people um, by voice and by presence um, as part of this conversation as well. Um, before we move to our conversation panel uh, with um, some young leaders, I wanted to quickly um, ask Anastasia Delasio um, on that segue from the United Nations Foundation to just tell us a few, a few words a little bit more about, as we move into this panel, about the Plus Social Good community and how it really is another convener and stakeholder uh, for many different voices. So Anastasia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. We're so excited to partner with CSIS for an event for International Youth Day. Um, youth is just incredibly important um, to the UN and to the UN Foundation in general. And we really think that the Plus Social Good platform that we launched is a, an amazing way to be able to unite young people and innovators from around the world. Um, right now you see so many different young innovators and entrepreneurs and youth organizations and change makers and it's ubiquitous, but everyone works in silos. So we hope that the Plus Social Good platform um, can be a really great and creative way to kind of bring the conversation together and pull everyone onto the same page. As you know, that today's event is live stream, so we're actually bringing in voices from around the world to contribute to the conversation here and the conversations that are happening all over the world. Um, and um, uh, I just want to 
finish up by saying um, in September we have our annual plus so, uh, social good summit. Um, it's alongside UN Week, and we're hoping that it'll be able to bring young voices into uh, the dialogue that happens alongside UN Week. So definitely check it out. Um, the hashtag and the theme for the event this year is 2030 now. So who better to bring the conversation about the future than youth? Um, we need to, to, take, uh, to take this dialogue to the next level and um, you know, be responsible for our future. So it's important that we contribute to the dialogue and to the policy that's being created around our future. So without further ado, I'd like to formally, I guess, announce the, the next panel. Um, a lot of great young change makers, some of whom are already members of the Plus Social Good community and um, have been responsible for helping to create really wonderful content and blogs um, and other events around issues relating to youth and um, to how we can use technology and innovation to better shape the future of the world. So I'd love to... Um, call on the next panel, Manny Yang, Ramona, and Calm. Thank you guys so much, and thanks, Nicole. Well, welcome, guys. Welcome to the second panel. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking uh, Nicole Golden for the opportunity to moderate this panel today um, and for putting me on the list. I've now gained two Twitter followers as a result, so I'm pretty <laughs> delighted about that. Um, if nothing else good comes out of this day, that, that's pretty positive. Um, I'm sharing stage today with two really incredible people um, who really are at the forefront of, of these issues and uh, are kind of uh, really on top of this. My own experience myself, I'm CSS is resident migrant. Um, I came here from Ireland two years ago um, and can speak to a, you know, kind of a personal level of, of, of the experience that a migr migrant feels and goes through coming to a new country. But um, I really think these people are, are fantastic. Man Yang is the founder and CEO of the Humanity Helping Sudan Project. He's going to talk a little bit, bit about that. And Ramona Dragomir is uh, the Atlas Core Fellow at International Association for Volunteer Effort. So we're going to begin, um, I want to kind of touch off what Manuel and also what uh, Nancy was talking about uh, surrounding the positivity that migrants, uh, that migration has and, and, and it can be seen in that kind of light. And would you be able to talk us through a little bit, your organization, how you feel about it and, and, and what your thoughts are? Well, uh, different from different people. You know, some people see migration very bad and some people see it in a good way. So when you enter to the country, um, if you're from Africa, people are gonna say, people are gonna think that oh, you may be sick, or you may have disease, or thing like that, or you may be like <coughs> somebody that's like vulnerable and cannot help each other and cannot help anything. Mm -hmm. He has nothing to offer to the continent. He has nothing to offer to anybody. So there's like a negative, and some people see okay, you from Africa, you may know a lot of things and some stuff. You know, it's like a different from place to place. And that's hard part of coming to a uh, new, uh, new place. Yeah. That's the way I see it, uh, basically. Yeah. And Ramona, from, from the European perspective, what, what can you add from that? Yeah. Um, so first of all, the discourse that we have in Europe about migration, we don't call it migration. We try to call it, because for, for at the European level and in the European politics, migration is something ooh, bad, right? It's, it's you know, it brings, um, um, it brings about uh, a negative connotation. So the way that the EU has coined this term is through the use of the word mobility, which means you know positive um, action, which means you know individual uh, mobility. I mean, um, moving around in the European Union, 28 member countries now, either through individual actions or through EU-funded programs. So um, part of its Europe 2020 agenda. Um, that the EU has put out is they're trying to um, sort of put together this mobile, if you will, um, workforce um, that um, has contributed to what the EU uh, tries to promote as a knowledge economy. So 
um, the EU is very, very much focused now on uh, mobility, but mobility with a purpose, with a purpose of gaining skills, with a purpose of um, trying out new job opportunities, if you will, um, with a purpose of ultimately being more of a European citizen, because that's what we're trying to create to sort of develop this identity of being part of the European Union. So most of the efforts that uh, the European Union is doing now um, is um, are targeted to giving the opportunity of people. And again, I'm talking about EU 28 member countries. I'm not talking about the EU as uh, the European uh, continent um, altogether. So, but within these 28 member countries, um, one of the rights, the most important rights that people are um, expected to have is the right to free movement. So that translates into uh, mobility, that translates into the right to work, study, live anywhere in the 28 um, countries. And this is what sort of the, the discourse that the EU is putting, um, putting forward. So try to look this as a positive perspective, um, um, sort of get a flow of east moving west, of north moving south, um, and uh, west moving east, if you will. And just to follow up on that, and Angela Merkel recently said, you know, people European citizens in general should be prepared to move, you know, and that it shouldn't be seen as this this big issue. You know, you look at the United States and it wouldn't be considered weird to move from, you know, Iowa to Illinois. It would just be considered a normal thing to do if, to follow work. Do you think that it's a cultural shift that needs to happen for people to, you know, see it more in a positive light? Um, sure. I mean, uh, and again, um, just try to think of the two flagship pro programs that the European Union has um, to sort of promote this idea of um, easy access from one country to another. Um, those are um, the Erasmus program, which is um, focused at providing the opportunity of students, so people who are enrolled in formal education, to go and study one semester or two semesters abroad in any country in the European Union. Um, sometimes in English, sometimes in the local language, but that's an opportunity for people to learn um, new and get new skills and learn new languages. And then the second program, which um, I used to work um, on, is a um, um, cross-border youth volunteer program called the European Voluntary Service, which is basically an opportunity for people between aged between 18 to 30 to volunteer abroad in one of the EU member countries. Um, and, um, you know, it's a, it's a training program, it's a learning program, and again, it's a service uh, program. So through these two uh, uh, programs, and not only, um, what the EU is doing is, first of all, promoting this idea of, yes, you can freely move, you can freely um, you know, live and work and volunteer in any of the EU member countries. And then having this as sort of at the back of people, and especially the young European generation, if you will, that oh, I'm not Romanian, or I'm not Lithuanian, or I'm not uh, whatever Bulgarian, but I am a, mem a, a European citizen. Hmm. Um, and, and just from inter integration perspective, Manja, we were speaking in the green room before he came out. Um, he was showing me a video that he posted on YouTube. Uh, it was uh, stu some like stupid misconceptions about Africans. And it's a video that, that Manja has posted of himself, um, you know, talking about the cliches that people think that Africans are like and, and these kind of ignorances that kind of flow across borders. What, what do you think are the kind of the obstacles towards integration when this migration happens? Well, there's a lot of things because, you know, um, when, I f uh, when I come here, I didn't know a lot of people. So I only know my flight is one, um, 167. That's a, a f my flight number. <laughs> so I didn't know a lot of people. So when I enter here, um, one thing I remember um, is going to school. It's still I tell a lot when I speak on a different thing. So I was running a track, and there was a girl uh, named uh, uh, Kelly Cooper, and she was running. She was running with me, and then out of nowhere, she she pulled her hat out, and then she said, "Do I look? Do I look? Can I run like that? Do I look good?" I say, "No." <laughs> now she's really mad. <laughs> I say, "Why?" She say, "You don't say like that." I say, "Okay, I thought you were asking me like seriously. I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't." <laughs> I didn't know I have to lie. And if I have to do that, and if I have to do that, okay. And everybody asks me, do I look good? I say, uh huh, yeah. You always okay? compliment. You're always always compliment the woman's Yeah, parents. you're always good. So that's the that's the thing that people have a conception about Africa. They will ask you, do you speak clicks? And it's like, thing like that. They will ask you like that. Something they saw on TV. Yeah. And okay, what do you? Uh, why do you? Is Africa a country? Is a, a continent? What well, they didn't know languages or thing like that. So, and they will ask you things like that, but when you ask them something different, they get mad. 
And they didn't know the same thing that is applied. Like you have some things and somebody can have to use um, the same thing. So it's like a lot of negative. And, but right now, people are trying to understand Africa differently. If you go to school, like five years ago, I enrolled to the University of uh, uh, Richmond. And African study was not very popular. But today, if you go, you will see a lot of African study are getting more, more students going there because they know, oh, I think we must learn so many things out of it. And people get to know that uh, the thing is changing a little by little now. And that's when you have to know that, OK, this is, there's a lot of change coming. And people want to be educated more about Africa than the Africa they used to know in 1960, a man uh, killing uh, animals and like a lion and thing like one picture they see for over the lifetime and never change. And this, there's going to be an, an HIV and AIDS and thing like people okay, <laughs> from Africa, you may have HIV and AIDS. I never get sick. I never been, I was born in Africa and lived there for 17 years. I never get sick. Honestly, I never did. I never, never, yeah, and it's <laughs> honest, true. I never, I never get sick. I get cold when I come here because it's cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but that's, that's the kind of situation you get yourself into. Even if you form an organization, people are going to ask you, um, is uh, where the organization going to work? Is there going to be war? <laughs> what if um, somebody could attack and build, burn your office? OK, burn it. I mean, people who live there in Africa, uh, they need help. When there's war, there's a lot of, more, there's a lot of need for help. Then the people who just live in peace. And I'm not going to scare about people, OK, they're going to burn my office. And they're going to run everything down. I mean, if you don't build anything, who will build it? And if you don't try to change things, who will change it? And you know, you get stuck down and everything. OK, where's the money going to go if the government change? I'm not a government. I'm a nonprofit organization called Humanity Helping Sudan, addressing a need for refugees. And that's what I do. I'm not a government. I don't try to be a government. Mm. So that's what this conception that you have when you're from Africa, you and you from um, Part and, and the economy is coming. So you go to Kabera in uh, Nairobi, Kenya, you will see now the street is very busy. You go to Addis Ababa, uh, uh, you go to Addis, uh, Addis Ababa, Bali, you will see the economy is moving. You go to Botswana, you will see also the economy is getting better. I mean, change take a while. And you just people need to just understand. Just to this. jump in on that, do you think that you know the role, I guess, of a, of a migrant in a new country as, as your as your I guess you're a representative of your, of your home country. Do you think it's the onus is on you to kind of change those perceptions or, or to integrate directly into society and, and kind of maybe perhaps even lose your, lose your heritage in order to integrate? <laughs> I mean, it's both. Because, you, you know, I was, there's some things, uh, I was refugees myself. I lived there for 13 years and I was something called the uh, um, Lost Boy of Sudan, which is a group of an accompanying minor that uh, run to know, but it didn't change the fact that I am from Sudan and if my life changed it, you know, I won't help those who I live with a long time. But come to the fact that, you know, I understand there's a lot of questions people won't know, and that's why I first the video. Actually, the video called Silly Question About Africa, Watch you, it. people love it because it's like, okay, I didn't get mad, I didn't get too mad, and I didn't get too hungry. And I just say, okay, this is what people ask you, and a lot of questions that people will be asking me. And people like it, and access, and people post it on their website. It was something to create that people can understand Africa differently. You know, not everybody who come from Africa always just have no money and be poor and broke. And no, not everybody who was born in Africa is sick and has not, nothing to do in the world. People are smarter. And, and who built the station in South, uh, the guy from South Africa is actually building uh, a satellite in, um, in Son of, uh, I just come, I, I go there like a month ago, he's building the, the station, the, the like going up the sky. What about the name? <laughs> yeah. I, did, I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, he's building it. This is from Africa. He was born there. And, and I mean, people, not, the problem of this is hunger, like food. You know, if you have agricultural resources, uh, water, uh, those are the things that I spend my time with because food is the only thing that people need to build. And Africa problem is two things. It just um, power. The, the thing you need is energy. Energy, you need more energy. And that's a very, very basic thing you need. You need a farming so people can farm more and then they can produce their own food. I mean, aid is good, but aid is something that people give you temporarily. So. And then just to build a little bit on what my colleague said, this idea of 
um, you know, when you go and you sort of travel and live abroad and you try to study somewhere else and you come from a different culture, it is sort of your duty as a, they call it a, a citizen diplomat, so um, to go and share and talk to people about your culture and about where you're coming from and what are the f some um, issues that people are facing where, where you're coming from because um, don't make the assumption that everybody's knowledgeable and everybody has access to um, the same resources so they know about, you know, if I'm coming from Transylvania or if he's um, coming from Africa, which is, you know, a country, right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> we all know that, right? So um, I think this is sort of um, taken upon us as, as people who choose to live in another country that we should um, share, you know, stuff about our, or um, issues about our, um, our place, the places where we're coming from and try to um, break down one of those, you know, stereotypes of everybody's um, hungry or starving in, um, in Africa. Guys, this is, um, unfortunately, we're, we're kind of running low. I have one more question. I have a bunch of other questions to ask, but unfortunately, um, time's away from us and I can see the food at the back and I can see everyone else looking back at it now. Um, <laughs> as, as young people, as young leaders, uh, and you kind of touched upon it there and you're, you're saying as, you know, as, as a migrant what, what your kind of duty is, what would you say you know, young people can do? This is National Youth Day. What, what, what can people do to kind of be more positive about this and I guess it be leaders and get engaged? What would you recommend? I think introduce them to job market. I think if you introduce them to job market, not only they will, um, they will create a job for themselves. A lot of people right now want to create a job that would help other people. You know, I've met a lot of them everywhere in the conference when I go to like a lot of people. I'm, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, and I get excited. I'm like, wow, everybody have a job. We want to do it themselves. Nobody's going to work for anybody anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but that's good because everybody will invent in some things. And, and you know, um, even I went to Ireland myself and I, with a group of people where you were from. <laughs> so I went to Ireland and I see a group of um, young people making, a, it's like a Facebook, but not a Facebook, it's like a book. A, a, a book, um, where well, they call it yearbook here in America, but they make it to form where it become a business. And I was like, wow, I bet that's good. <laughs> and that's what you need because, you know, building, especially Africa need a building capacity, job marketing. Like, not only like you go there and opens, like factory would be, be the best now, but if you have a solar energy, like people need, because I'm big on farming and I'm big on energy, I'm trying to give, like you know, a local farmer, uh, something they can water irrigation system thing they can do, but I think Africa is a younger generation. It's not younger generation by saying, okay, people who live there uh, never live older. There's some people who live older. I mean, you, Nelson Mandela is a famous person, but live 94 years. There's a lot more people you can find like that. But what they say is, they, what they're saying is that, like a lot of younger people tend to li live there in Africa. I mean, that's political term of saying, and the economic is um, seven out of ten, if I don't get a mistake. <laughs> yeah, so, so you introduce them to that job market, okay, create your own kind of job, you know, introduce them how the world is coming into now, and that's what the young people need, a leadership, you know, a skill to do things, building capacity and things like that, and I think, um, I was reading Nicole actually, uh, I, I follow her on Twitter, she had the machine, like, trust me. <laughs> she had the big machine that anybody over here would ever need. She come from the State Department, the USAID, and I was really, I was like, wow, I mean, why are you working in CIA? <laughs> I mean, she, yeah, yeah, she had a big machine, and she worked with Clinton. If you go on her Twitter, you will see that she was a picture with uh, Hillary Clinton. And, and you guys are very young, too. And look, you are young and young over there and very young, so just be a, be a everything you can. I would have to say three things. Um, first, try to identify what are your passions or pursue your passions. Um, and this is, um, these three things is um, what we, in, in the host organization where I, um, engage, I'm engaged here in the US, we try to do in relation to youth volunteering. So identify your passions. Is it, I don't know, um, agriculture, is it, um, health, is it um, community service, whatever. Um, and then um, try to sort of build your skills related to that passion. You know, do you need to do, do you need more training? Do you need more education? Do you need more um, networking? Do you, can you find those opportunities 
in your home country? Do you not have to go outside of your um, you know, territory to find those? And then once you have those skills, try to sort of multiply the impact of what you've done or learned or built so far. Talk to other people, um, engage, network. Um, and I guess this is something that everybody knows, but try, you know, if you have sort of a, a plan, so stated goals, how to get there, um, and then some sort of, you know, measurable deliverables, if you will, um, um, then I think you know, it, it works and um, it's something clear that you want to do and where you want to go. Well, thank you guys. Thank you so much for providing for your insights. Um, and uh, I think that concludes our panel. I think we can go and have our lunch. Thanks, guys. <laughs>